Oh, this is new. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. As you said, I'm Steve Lockhart. I'm currently an undergrad here at ASU studying computer science. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I know I'm a programmer and wearing a suit on a stage this is not my natural habitat. <laughs> But anyway, uh, today I'm here to talk to you guys about disability in the digital age. And part of the reason for that is last summer, I was part, as part of my capstone project for uh, senior year, I worked on the robotic guide dog. Uh, and the reason I got involved with that project partly was from back when I was a freshman, I got to see Stephen Hawking actually right here on this stage. And yeah, seeing him, it was pretty inspirational. And it got me thinking a lot about just how much technology allowed him to do all the things he was able to do later in his life. And if he'd been born earlier, just even 20 or 30 years, he probably wouldn't have been able to do nearly as much. Yeah. So obviously throughout history, there's plenty of examples of just different exceptional people, all who've just shattered our views of what anyone with a disability could achieve in life. And most of them have gone on to do th more things than any of us, really. But we have to remember that these people are the exceptions. And generally, even today, with all our technology, life with a disability is pretty difficult still. Just last month, I was able to look at an article about Walmart laying off its greeters, which happened to affect a lot of disabled employees there. And pictured here is a guy named John, and they also talked to another fellow named Mitchell. And all Mitchell had to say about it was that he wants a place to work a place to go every day, to be out in society, and most of all, be able to support himself, which is something all of us want, really. But unfortunately, it's not just one article, and it's not just an individual person. If we look at our whole country, for everyone who's disabled, not even 40% are able to have a full-time job. And that's compared to 80% of everyone else who's able to work. And this is from 2017 this data, and it hasn't changed much for the past two decades even, unfortunately. And also, I just want to make a note so you guys don't walk away with the impression I first had seeing these numbers. Uh, unemployment is not the inverse of employment here, so it's not 60% unemployment, but I won't turn this into an economics lecture because I'll fall asleep myself if we go there. Yeah. <laughs> but obviously, a seeing percentage isn't that helpful. We have to know how many people we're talking about. So in, in our country, there are in total 40 million people who live with a disability every day. And that's more than any single state, and it's more than most countries. It's just about equal to the size of the population of Canada, which is a lot of people. And that's just for our own country. If we take it even further and we go globally, there is estimated to be a billion people in the world who live with a disability every day. And I know that number is pretty shocking and hard to believe, but it comes from the World Health Organization and other major international groups like the UN. So it's a pretty well-cited number. <laughs> but obviously, technology isn't going to solve every problem for anyone with a disability. It's not going to be the silver bullet and provide all our solutions. You know, Blockchain alone can't work its magic. <laughs> but at the very least, it can be something we keep in mind. And at best, it can be used to make new tools to help people. So let's just take a look at a simple daily task that we've all probably done here. Amazon, right? We've all probably shopped there in the last week alone. And this is the bottom of their homepage. And if you look through it, I know the text is a bit small, but if you look, you're going to have a hard time finding anything about accessibility on there at all. It'll take you a long time because it's not on there. You have to search for it. And I give them some credit. Once you do find their page, it's actually got a lot of useful info. And on top of that, even products that weren't expressly designed for people with disabilities, like Alexa, have really improved the quality of life for a lot of disabled people, even my grandma. <laughs> and on top of that, we even used it as our voice control system in our robotic dog. So they do have features. But obviously, it's better if we start off from the start creating accessible content. So. Twitter, YouTube, things we've all probably used as well. If you, on both of those sites, you can go into your settings under accessibility on Twitter and enable captioning that allows blind users to see and read what a picture is showing on their screen reader. 
And on YouTube, there's even community closed caption options, which are really great because that way you get some accuracy and feedback from a lot of different people, and you can translate to other languages as well. But the problem here is these are both buried deep in the settings, and a lot of us probably aren't even going to look at our accessibility settings, let alone the settings. So unfortunately, what we're left with a lot of the time is auto-captioning. And as we all know, if you use auto-captions, you're going to have a bad time. Yeah. I know. Yes, yes. I know we, got, we all laugh at it, but it's still an impressive technology. Just the technology alone is amazing. And once it's perfected, it's really going to be a huge boost in accessibility. But part of this reason we laugh at it as well is it's not used properly, even in its present form. It's not meant to be a complete replacement for captioning content. It's just meant to assist and make things quicker. Both Facebook and Google on their sites say, please review our auto captions before you post, because there's going to be inaccuracies. But most of us just click through and want to post our content. It's kind of like signing terms of service. <laughs> but things are changing. Even among major companies, we're getting awareness. Even among something simple like emojis. A major push last year from Apple caused disability emojis to start to be rolled out this year. And that's in part thanks to companies realizing they have a large number of disabled users. Like I said, there's a billion people in the world. Some of them are going to use phones and want to be represented. But in the best cases, it's not just emojis and simple things like this, where it's people who are disabled being kept in mind. It's actual technology being developed to help people who are disabled. Just in the past year, Google and Microsoft have both come out with new apps that allow, through computer vision, blind users to know what's in the world around them, from reading cash or just seeing if someone familiar is approaching them. It's a really great boost in accessibility. Of course, just like auto-captioning, we're going to have times where the computer isn't always right. So in those cases, there's apps like Be My Eyes, which connect blind users with sighted volunteers who can tell them what's happening or if their outfit matches or just whatever brief help they need. And that's a really great solution. And this is just in software on your phone. Among the hardware space, in the past year, there's been even bigger changes. We've all probably seen the commercial during the Super Bowl for the Xbox Adaptive Controller which is really extraordinary because it can be customized to suit a broad range of different disabilities. And on top of that, users aren't segregated when they're playing together. So if you're disabled or not disabled, everyone plays together, which is exactly the way it should be. And if you're seeing all this, yeah, I know, give it up for their accessibility. <laughs> well, that's exactly how it should be, right? So. With that in mind, some of you might be thinking, wow, I want to get involved with this and make things more accessible. Well, you can do exactly what I did. There's our group of 12 who did the guide dog. You can get involved in our group. We combine those hardware and the software aspects to make this little guide dog that, well, it's still a prototype. It's part of that foundation that proves that we can do things with even existing technology to help people who are disabled. And in addition to that, you can develop newer technologies expressly designed for people who are disabled. And that's something we really need. And I'm really grateful that at ASU I had that opportunity. Yeah. But, <laughs> but also, I love ASU because we have that spirit of acceptance. And not just when it comes to getting in, but <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a good thing. It really is. Because we have to be accepting in order to not exclude people. And we need that spirit of acceptance. Yeah. <laughs> so with that acceptance in mind, we can all do our own part, not just to reduce this divide in the digital world, but to make it a place that enables people with different disabilities to work and participate in society in ways that they clearly haven't been able to in the past. And that's what we need for the next generation. So thank you all for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> Great audience. <laughs>